So I'd like to introduce uh, Colonel Robinson, who's the commander of the Ravenna Arsenal. He's going to talk to us tonight about the history and the future of the Ravenna Arsenal. Uh, uh, Colonel Robinson is from Ohio, Rittman, actually, and he graduated from Kent State, so he knows the area around here quite well. And he's been with the Ohio National Guard for 38 years. And his wife is here with him tonight, Tina. And he has two children, um, and they live in Portage Lakes, so local folks. Thank you. Uh, I'll try not to be too loud. Uh, I need to be close to the screen so I can see some of my slides. I think, Mike, you're going to be boom for me. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you. It's a great honor and privilege to be here tonight. Um, one of the taskings when I first took command out here uh, from General Harris was we have to pull back the curtain. We have to show people what it is we do now at the former Ravenna Arsenal and also um, interact with the community because the community is so valuable to us. So the first thing I want to say is um, thank you to all the veterans here. I know I met Mike and I met Rick, both veterans. Are there any other veterans here today? Thank you so much for your service, everyone. Without you, you led the way for us. There's a lot of benefits that we get nowadays that the, sorry, I'm getting some feedback that the um, the veterans that before us didn't really have, um, the customs and courtesies we received that the veterans didn't really receive come back from Vietnam. So we greatly appreciate that. And are there any spouses in the audience tonight? Okay. Well, my spouse is here, so, and, and she will tell you, um, that it's a team effort, especially the last couple of years of my career, the level of uh, urgency and the level of um, complication that I've had to go through uh, only could have made it with the support of my wife. So she's still here. And I thank all the spouses for what they do. Um, so as I was getting ready to come up here, I was thinking about uh, the bio I shared with Ken and talks about my father. My father was uh, a vet and he was always very proud of my service. Um, but I wanted to give you a little anecdote about my grandfather. So my grandfather was also a soldier. It just so happened, though, that he fought in World War I uh, for the Germans. He was conscripted. He was a German soldier. And during the fighting, he was captured and he was made a POW. So he spent the last eight months of the war, World War I, as an American POW. And he got three hot meals a day. He had a good bed to sleep in, warm blankets. And when he went home to Germany after the war, he was released. He told his family that he lived better as an American prisoner than he did as a German soldier. So when his time came to leave, he left Germany, came to America and met my grandmother. And here I am today, an American soldier because of how life was there. So anytime you have a question about whether or not America is the best country in the world or America is the best place to live, I think that story tells you a lot about it. So um as I said, I'm the commander, Camp James A. Garfield. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about CJAG, what that means uh, in further slides. Next slide, please, Mike. So we're going to talk about the history and mystery of the Ravenna Arsenal. Um, there's still so much that goes on and around. Everybody seems to have their own opinion. They have a story, an anecdote about the Ravenna Arsenal, um, especially in the communities around us, Charlestown, Paris, Wyndham, <laughs> Newton Falls. Um, they all have... Um, People that work there, they have stories to share, and there's just really an emotional attachment with all those communities in the Ravenna Arsenal. I uh, talk a lot about the myths, because there are a lot of myths, and then uh, I'm going to bore you with a lot of Army vernacular about uh, capabilities and what the future is going to look like at our post. So next slide, please. So if you get on Google Maps and you look at Portage County, um, the former Ravenna Arsenal CJAG now is one seventh of the entire Portage County, 23,000 acres. And it's heavily wooded, uh, deciduous wood trees. And it has 33 miles of fence around there. And as I said, people let their imaginations run wild. What's going on inside that Ravenna Arsenal? Are there, is there UFOs in there? Is there underground submarine bases? So it's very interesting. Nuclear missiles. Uh, some a gentleman, Joe, was just asking me about the possibility of a landing strip, which actually there is a possibility of a aircraft landing strip on there. But um, as far as the the capabilities of the modern American warfare systems, um, tanks and artillery cannot be fired 
on Ribbon Arsenal. Other than that, though, every other weapon systems in the entire platform, we could even shoot helicopters, have their guns down onto some of our ranges. So uh, tanks and artillery will never be fired there, but the rest of the platforms, the rest of the live fire strategy can all be fired um, at CJAG. So I always thought that was interesting. I made it a little bit darker there, but um, there's three uh, d indisputable facts about why the site was selected. Most people will say, uh, next slide, please, that the cloud cover was a reason. Has anyone ever heard of cloud cover? Okay, people will verify it's a it's an absolute myth. Cloud cover was never considered when they were selecting the site. Um, pretty much every time I brief this, there's usually some clouds out there because we have a lot of clouds in Northeast Ohio, but cloud cover, cover was never a factor. Um, the main factor was the two railroads, the Baltimore, Ohio and the Erie Lackawanna. So they could get material, they could get people, they could transport the munitions out. So that was the number one deciding factor. Number two deciding factor was the availability of very cheap farmland. Um, their stories, people will tell you that their parents or grandparents were forced off the property. That's not true. There was no eminent domain. Uh, every parcel was bought and then people were given 90 days to leave. So by they started buying property in 1939. By 1940, uh, the entirety of the 22,000 acres was purchased and people had left. And then the last um, reason why the site was selected was uh, the available workforce. At that time, they had workforce in Canton and Cleveland, Youngstown, Warren. Uh, there was a lot of um, available workers to be able to get this up and running. And luckily, they had the foresight to understand in 1940 what was going on in the European theater, what was going on in the Pacific theater. So they knew that um, being prepared and having munitions was going to be critically important. Next slide, please. So there's a myth that we have all these underground bunkers. So when you're talking about an underground bunker, what they're really talking about is an above ground magazine. So um, most people from this area understand that our ground is very wet, very saturated. We have a lot of wetlands. We have a lot of rivers and creeks. We've got rivers that flow south and end up north, right? And Cuyahoga River goes flows south and ends up in Lake Erie. So we have a lot of wetlands. So nothing was really built below ground. The magazines were built above ground and they had this 18 inch thick head wall. Um, they had 24 inch thick walls around it. It was built to house these munitions. And many of these munitions had 250,000 pounds of explosives in them. So they didn't want these buildings to explode. So they built them very robustly. And at the end, they covered them with earth. Um, so if you were to come today, there was originally there was 693. There's around 612 or 11, depending on how you count them. Uh, some of them are used for tornado shelters. Some of them are used for other size munition storage. Um, but they, uh, you know, they built all these and at, at the time, 600 plus. So that's one of our um, challenges is that we're the only training center in the United States that's building on top of a former something else, right? We're building a training center on top of a former arsenal. So we have to remove things and demolish things while we're building things up. And no one else has that challenge. Also in this picture, I don't know if you can see it or not, but you see the rails in front of the uh, earth covered magazine. So those rails were built all across post and they had the uh, ties and they built up the rail beds. So luckily for us, the rail beds were built uh, very robustly. And to this day, we use those rail uh, to get around the rail beds, to get around posts, to get across trails, to get move our tanks, move our Bradleys. Um, so these are the only way we get around posts is because of these rail beds. So next slide, please. Uh, this kind of gave you an overhead shot of what it looked like in the 40s. You can see in the yellow how the bunkers were all staggered. Uh, earth covered magazines were staggered and you can see the rail lines going through. It wasn't as heavily wooded in the 40s as it is now. Um, if you were to go down, this is a block um, on the far west side of Post. If you're going on there now, uh, you would not be able to see really anything but trees. Um, but the way they built this was it was intended that if one of those were to explode, that it wouldn't start a daisy chain down the line and end up exploding all over Post. So to this day, we still do a lot of demolitions training. We do C4. We do Bangalore torpedoes. We do hand grenade training. And invariably, someone will call the sheriff or will call the Ohio State Patrol and say, the arsenal is exploding. The munitions are blowing up. 
but that's not true. The only thing that's blowing up is things that we intend to blow up. So grenades and demolitions. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a myth that the bombs are still there. I think, uh, I don't know if it was Joe or Rick, someone was asking me about, uh, do we still store any munitions on post? So the only thing that we store on post at our ASP, our ammo supply point, is munitions that have been ordered to use. So for example, if they're doing rifles, they'll have the 5.56 five, or the 7.62 or the 50 cal. If they're doing hand grenades, if they're doing Claymore mines, we'll have that, deck cord, whatever they plan to train with, those are the munitions on post and those have come to us by bonded carriers and then soldiers will draw them and go out and train with them. We don't house any other munitions on post. So there's nothing, um, there's none of these 155 rounds, there's nothing heavy explosives, there's no heavy gunpowder, uh, any of those things are, none of those are still on post. But these pictures give you an idea of what they looked like. They were very careful to keep, it was mostly black powder that was in the projectiles. And they were very careful to keep the projectiles away from the fuses and the boosters. They never assembled them all together until the munitions were ready to ship overseas. And uh, I forgot to mention, there's there's several uh, websites. There's one from the Ravenna Ordnance Plant, and there's one that's Ravenna Army Ammunition Plant, RVAAP. And those websites go into detail about how much munitions were produced, what their daily output was, how many employees were on post. <clears throat> so they, they will um, elaborate and give you a lot more facts if you're interested in knowing that. Um, but I got a very good account from that website that the majority of munitions dropped in the German theater were produced at the Ravenna Arsenal. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's there's a myth about being EPA cleanup site. I think Joe was asking me about this. <clears throat> so when you look at these pictures here, they are intentionally crashing aircraft and they were trying to test for a couple of things. They were testing for the survivability of the fuel because they wanted to see if the crew and the actual munitions had any purpose afterwards, right? Um, and they were testing to see if, uh, you know, they could reuse anything after they were trying to develop a new fuel so it didn't burn so much. Um, so they were intentionally collapsed, uh, crashing these airplanes. So at the time, it was the early 40s. There was two major wars on, one in the European theater, one Pacific theater. So they weren't paying attention to really the EPA standards, right? They were testing it. So, yes, a lot of that lead, a lot of that fuel uh, seeped into the ground. And this is the Winklepeck burning grounds, if anyone's familiar with the uh, with the post. But um, they've been really since the 60s, they've been putting a, a concerted effort to clean up. And the one gentleman, David, was telling me about Irene Moore, who worked at the cleanup site. My director, um, Tim Morgan, environmental director, has worked there for 30 years. It's over $200 million they spent in cleanup at their event arsenal over the last 40 years to get this back up. So a lot of this... So this this myth is actually true. There are some what they're called areas of concern. There's no super fun site. There's no circla anymore on post, no cleanup like that. But there is uh, several sites that are areas of concern, and we continue to remediate that. Right. The narrative is that we're 95% remediated, and that's why we train so much on post now. So next slide, please. Uh, this is interesting. I don't know if anyone saw uh, Captain America. The Winter Soldier, uh, that's Chris Evans, and that's Scarlett Johansson. Uh, they were on post for three weeks filming, and there's like a minute and 17 seconds in the film from Captain America, right? Even though they were on for three weeks. Um, this is uh, one of the gates off of Route 5. We call that the Hollywood Gate because they set it up with the, the stop signs at Camp Lehigh. And then in the bottom right, it's hard to see, but there's that's actually Cleveland in the, far, in the foreground there, the lights of Cleveland. But... They put a couple of our um, storage buildings, one of our earth-covered magazines, and they made this composition shot. So in the movie, you see this shot, but that does not exist on our post anywhere. It's a compilation composition of several areas on post, right? But a minute and 17 seconds in that movie is, is our, our camp. Next slide, please. Um, several people have mentioned UFOs. Um, if you get on the internet, there's a thing called the Freedom Demon, which is the far west side of Post Freedom Township. Um, supposedly, is looks like Mothman. I've been there seven years. I've never seen it. Um, but on the far side of Post, it's very, very dark at night, very thick woods, so the imaginations run wild. Um, 
but people will say there's UFOs on there. There's several things, but I'm here to tell you the seven years that I've been in command, there's a lot of natural beauty on our post. The foliage, the foliage in the fall is just unbelievable with all the trees. We've got tons of deer. We've got an eagle. We've got a black bear. We've got um, just fish and everything you could think of. Turkeys are out there. Uh, we do three deer hunts. So there's a lot of natural beauty. This picture is the Stone Arch Bridge. It was built in 1865, and it's out there by the Wadsworth Road near the city of Wyndham. Um, but training and natural beauty are the two things that we really focus on. And those are the things that I've seen in my seven years out there at, the, at Camp James A. Garfield. All right. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, when you come past Route 5, you see our sign out front, Camp James A. Garfield. So over the years, you had... RTLS, and I think I actually saw a map that says Ravenna, Ravenna Training Logistics Site, right? That's when it was first going in over to the Ohio National Guard. Uh, there was a Camp Ravenna. There was a Ravenna Ordnance Plant, Ravenna Army Depot. Um, there's several different uh, acronyms with Ravenna. So uh, our commanding officer, General Harris, wanted to sort of draw a line in the sand and let people know we're going to respect our history. We're going to respect what the Ravenna name was. But moving forward, we're going to be Camp James A. Garfield because our aspiration is to be the best training center in Ohio and train soldiers to fight and win America's wars and focus on training. So ever since the 18th of October 2018, we've been we changed our name to Major uh, Major General James A. Garfield. He was a two star general uh, in the Civil War. He led Ohio troops and he fought for uh, General Rosecrans in the Civil War. Uh, two of his sons were also officers, and he was the 20th president of the United States. So um, General Harris wanted to honor him and name him. Uh, we did find out after the fact that when you name something after a president, there's several uh, offices in the uh, in the federal government you have to go through in order to name something after a president. But we drove on, and it took us a couple of years, but then we got official recognition from NGB in Washington, National Guard in Washington, that we could be called James A. Garfield. So we, on post, we lovingly call it CJAG, which is Camp James A. Garfield. Um, but we still, to this day, I'll be out in the city and people say, hey, where, do, where are you stationed at? And I'll say, Camp James A. Garfield. And they're like, where is that? And I say, well, the Ravenna Arsenal. And then everyone knows where we were. Um, where do the troops who are trained on the post come? Uh, we've got troops that come from all over. We've got troops. As a matter of fact, other than Space Force, we have trained every other DOD entity. So we've trained Marines, Marine Reserves, Navy, Naval Reserve, Army, Army Reserve, National Guard, Air Force, Air Reserve, have all trained on our post. So that's the that's the reason for the name change, and that's the reason why um, we went ahead and made that that move. And, we're, and our aspiration is still to become, you know, the the premier training site in Ohio. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what we are today. Next slide. Um, America fought this. Uh, I, I have two all-expense trips, uh, paid trips to Iraq, and I got one all-expense paid trip to Afghanistan. So I was part of this, what we called COIN, counterinsurgency fight. Um, we, we stayed on what was called FOBs, which is Ford Operating Bases. And from these FOBs, we would conduct operations. SASO, civilian support operations or community support operations or movement to contact with the enemy, with insurgents. So we stayed on these fives we, and we moved out. Um, and our, our near peers watched our tactics and they watched what we were developing. And they pretty much, um, our leaders said, we need to get back to fighting in the woods. We need to get back to what's called rehoning our field craft or becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. So today's training doctrine is you'll show up someplace, you'll break out your, your pup tents or your drash tents, you'll conduct operations, you'll pack everything up and move again. And fortunately, at Camp James A. Garfield, we have a lot of 23,000 acres, we have a lot of open space, we have an open area where we can do this. So uh, we're fighting the new doctrine is to get away from fob warfare and get back to fighting in the field, because that's what we expect our next big fight is going to look like. Next slide, please. So this is sort of the menu. If, if you were a commander, you came to our post and you wanted to train your company or your battalion. We haven't got enough bed space to train a brigade yet. We're working on it. 
but you want to train your company, you want to train a battalion, these, this is your live fire menu. You can go through what's called a shoot house, which is live fire, which has rooms in them. You can do room clearing, your grenade launchers, rifles. You can do combat pistol qualification, fire movement. You can do demolitions, live hand grenades, laser tank range. Again, we can't fire the live tank round. We can fire the lasers on the round and we can hit targets. We have a tank range where the it's half scale where the targets can be hit, but no, excuse me, no live tanks. Um, we do have hand to hand combat. We got a repel tower and then we're still doing IED doctrine, although that doctrine has come, come and gone because a lot of our enemies aren't using IEDs anymore. And then I always like to point out, if you see over in the red, all these different virtual trainers. So you'll have what's called an EST. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, convoy operations trainer, battlefield simulators, call for fire. And what, what these are is these are exactly what they sound like. It's like, um, call of duty. It's like Xbox because today's soldiers, today's young soldiers have, have grown up with this and they learn that and that's their modem. That's their method of learning. So they'll do this virtual training first and then they'll go out in the field and conduct operations. So I know many of the veterans in here, myself, we go to basic training. We didn't do anything virtual, but that's the modem of the day. That's the way they learn. I was suspect on the EST because I'd rather have my soldiers out in the field and teaching them good good firing techniques, you know, teaching them breathing techniques, teaching them trigger squeeze and sight pitcher. Um, but what I don't account for is if it's, if you got one day on the range and it's raining or you got one day on the range and it's freezing, you know, these guys haven't worn their full kit, their body armor all year long. So they get their kit out, they go to the range, they're uncomfortable. They can't get square, you know, they're rolling around. And what the EST does is allows them to, go to a building that's air conditioned or go to a building that's heated. They take off their kit. They relax. They focus on sight picture. They focus on trigger squeeze. They focus on breathing and lets them get some at bats. And it doesn't cost you as a commander. It doesn't cost you time or ammo because the guys are just going through rotations, the EST. And then they go out to the range and it doesn't matter if it's raining or freezing because now they're relaxed and they feel confident again in their weapon and they go to range and qualify. And that makes you as a commander feel good. Um, so I've I've come to understand and, and appreciate uh, the virtual options that we have nowadays for training. Next slide, please. So if you were to come to our post, again, 23,000 acres, you see our central range complex. Most of our ranges are oriented to keep all the live fire on post. Um, so we've got different training areas. We've got light maneuver space, heavy maneuver space. Um, so I like showing this slide because it pretty much shows you that all 23,000 acres of our post is covered with some kind of training area. So every inch has something, whether it's a tactical training area, bivouac site, whether it's a range, um, a structural collapse simulator, there's always things that are being built and covered on our post. And the biggest thing we've been focused on lately, especially with the environmental cleanup is maneuver because now our our tanks and our Bradleys and our track vehicles can really get out and get in the woods and get in the maneuver space and practice with their actual vehicles. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what's called a mil um, military operations on urban terrain. Um, it's a connect village we made, but it gives commanders and it gives troops a really good idea to come in and, and conduct operations. Now, they're not always combat operations. Sometimes they're their search operations, sometimes their community engagement operations. We have female engagement teams that will go in and engage with the other females. So it, it's information gathering sometimes, but it gives um, those at-bats and those techniques to commanders so that they can try out and figure out what's going on in the mount. Next slide, please. Our Homeland Response Force. I think it was Mike, were you? Uh, Rick was talking about that. Yep. So we've got emergency management folks. We've got um, ODOT will come out here and train with us. The Ohio State Patrol, um, several of our EMA um, different partners will come out. Um, Governor DeWine is very big on joint training. So anytime we can include a state agency in the military, we learn each other's language. We learn each other's operating procedures. They'll come out. Uh, in the top right, what you see here is um, this is – training and practicing like a dirty bomb went off, something chemical went off in a city. So first responders are showing up and they're trying to help casualties, but they're trying to make sure that they themselves don't become casualties. So they'll start the triage here. They'll they'll decontaminate the victim as they go through. And then the far end, the doctors 
will, the nurses will help treat after they've been deconned. Um, so it's kind of a uncomfortable training scenario. However, it teaches them what they're going to need to survive in that kind of an environment, chemical environment. Also down here on the bottom left, you see the engineers, they're breaching an obstacle. So we have a, a structural collapse simulator and people will come out and they'll, you know, try to recover. Um, they have this thing that's called a bunny where it sits down and will hide it somewhere. And the dogs always find it, but then the soldiers themselves have to go through and jackhammer and get into wherever we hit that object so they can try to do some personnel recovery. Next slide, please. Structural collapse simulator, same thing I was just showing you. So it's simulating after the Oklahoma City bombing, what they have to do if they do, if someone does, um, you know, uh, it's affectionately known as a rubble pile sometimes, but it teaches you those skills needed to recover people out of something like that. Next slide. Talked a little bit about the shoot house. Uh, we use it, but the, um, the uh, Trumbull County, uh, Portage County SEAL SWAT teams, uh, a lot of different... Um, uh, Cuyahoga County SWAT team will come out and they practice in our shoot house because it gives them a, an idea of room clearing whenever that's needed. Next slide, please. Getting close to the end. Uh, engagement skills trainer. Uh, like I explained, you can see the soldiers are more comfortable because their kit's off. They're sitting down in the prone position. They're taking their time, getting their sight pictures back, and getting their at-bats at, at firing again. Next slide. Okay, in the future, what we're looking at for future capabilities. So, in the seven years that I've been there, there's been $37 million spent. And for that $37 million of taxpayer money, we've gotten new barracks. We've gotten a post headquarters. We've gotten maintenance bays. We've gotten um, a $7.6 million machine gun range. We've gotten other capabilities. And these are all improvements over what the old post would be. Anyone who's familiar with the post, this used to be the headquarters area of the post where they had the administration building and they had family housing. If you come here now, you'll see all these barracks and these dining facilities, our DPWs, you have company headquarters buildings. So this is part of that $37 million investment uh, in us. And that that's National Guard Bureau showing faith in us, showing faith of how much throughput, how many soldiers we have. We're finally attracting soldiers from Michigan and Pennsylvania. You know, I've been in 38 years. I've probably been to Grayling, Michigan 12 times, at least 12 times. <laughs> And it makes me feel good now that as an Ohio soldier, we're training in Ohio instead of driving to Michigan, driving to Pennsylvania, driving to West Virginia. Next slide. Okay, so these are the sexy ranges that we've gotten recently. We've got an automated record fire range uh, that came on online in 2020. Also the combat pistol qualification range. And then uh, just this past summer, May 7th, we brought our multi-purpose machine gun range online. And if you notice all those investments, $4 million, $2 million, $7.6 million, this is MILCON money, which means military construction, which means that we showed, we proved that we have the throughput to merit the government giving us this money and opening these ranges for us. And the multi-person machine gun range really makes us a destination because if we have that, you can finish your entire crew sort of weapons platform. So not only can the individual soldier train, but you can train crews on heavy machine guns, 50 caliber, 240s, uh, Mark 19s, 5.56 saws. So these are weapons systems that are mounted on either platform or tripod or on a vehicle. So now we're pulling tanks, we're pulling trucks, things that are heavy 50 cals on them so that they can actually train on their vehicles, firing and engaging targets. Next slide, please. So you might ask what, why is it, why is a pop-up range? It seems expensive and why is it more important? So what you see on the left or actually what you see in the center, that's a 25 meter zero target. So the soldiers haven't fired in a year. They'll show up on range day. They'll aim at this 25 meter target. And the idea is to get five out of six in that center circle. So you will adjust your sights. You'll adjust your posture. You'll adjust your breathing, your aim point until you get five out of six on the paper. Now, in the old days, once you zeroed, you'd come down here to the same 25-meter target and shoot at these paper silhouettes. So it was a way of qualifying, not very sexy, not very, you don't have a good time at it, right? And that's what you fired on. Now, on the far right here, you see this is a pop-up target. So that target coffin, we call it, will be 100 meters, 250 meters, 300 meters down range, and that green silhouette will pop up and present. And now you fire at that. So if you knock it down, and you're only knocking it down if you're trusting your NCOs and you're doing good firing techniques, if you knock it down, you leave feeling much more lethal. 
aggressively lobby aggressively. Well, thank you very much for um, that chamber doing that for us. So that's the difference between a pop-up range and just a paper target range. It leaves the soldier feeling like more capable, more lethal, like they can accomplish their job. Next slide, please. So this is the center of post. So as a matter of fact, this is on top of that Winkle Peck burning ground that I showed you earlier where the planes were crashing. So this was part of the um, $200 million cleanup. And the Department of the Army came out and gave our environmental office an award for all the work done here. And then at the end of the day, once the cleanup was complete, we built this $7.6 million range on top of that. So what you're seeing on the top left are you're seeing the far targets, which are 1,500 meters, 1,400 meters, 1,100 meters, which is just ridiculous. It's like three or four football fields is where the targets are. But with today's optics and today's lasers, you can get on and laser a target that far away with a 50 caliber machine gun or with a heavy sniper weapon or with 7.62. And then on the bottom right here, these are all 800 meter targets. These are more for your grenade launchers and your machine guns, you know, your Mark 19s, your saws to, to travel on those. So, uh, but this is the layout of that machine gun range. Next slide. From Google Earth, you see the range overlaid on the Winklepeck burning grounds, and that's in the very center of post. And then the outside, you see some of the blocks where the earth covered magazines still are. We had to do a ricochet analysis, $25,000 ricochet analysis because of the potential of all that. But um, they approved us, and we went ahead and built the range. All right, I think. Okay, so this is the best part for me because there's always questions about the history, is this really, is there a Bigfoot out there? No, I've never seen Bigfoot. So sorry about that. Um, but I enjoy questions and I'm here for every question you could possibly give me. And hopefully I'll give you the best answer, sir. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I did say, I explained to the one lady before that I have a German mother, right? So I, it was yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. From about that high. So even before the army. So, okay. Maybe, uh, six or seven years ago, with a huge amount of uh, construction, mm -hmm. and some of the, the, the uh, old uh, buildings, uh, mm -hmm. earth-covered magazines, yeah. Yes, sir. So, so we tried something um, that was what we call training area 71, which coincidentally had 71 earth covered magazines in it. Right. So we, there was some demo money from the army head national guard bureau. And, and that's the thing about army spending. So like I was talking to my wife today, I, I've, we've gotten down to $89,000 left to spend this year. She's like, I can spend $89,000 at the coach store like this. Right. But, um, you have to be very careful when you're spending government money. It's always purpose, time, and amount. So you have to have a sp specific thing. And there was a category for demolition that we had plenty of. So we said, let's try this training area 71. Let's demolish the whole area. And we did. And that made a lot of maneuver space for the tank, 40 acres. So it ended up being 40 acres. So if you can imagine 71 of those earth covered magazines I showed you were demolished in one hit. And that was nice and it was good, but we haven't had that much demo money since. We also got a couple of the old buildings in the depot area near near where the hearf is. Uh, so we knocked down a couple of those older buildings. Uh, that made for some more training space for setup for the hearf. The uh, hearf is Homeland Response Force. So I'm sorry if I get acronyms, you have to stop me. But um, but those buildings. So I think that was like 2016, actually. So. 2016, and that was a lot of demolition. And they had to take that con the um, <clears throat> the concrete, and it had the asbestos paper and the dirt, and they had to refine it, sift it, and then they brought the dirt back on post, and they took the concrete and the asbestos paper away. So that was a gigantic undertaking. I think it was like seven hundred thousand dollars. I want to say somewhere like that to do that one area, and that was part of that demolition. Yes, sir. Okay. You're welcome, sir. Was an electrician at the arsenal from '89 to '97. Outstanding. I had keys for every building, every place, uh, and we we dealt with a lot of asbestos 
Yes, sir. The transite buildings. Transite roofs, they, yep. They couldn't drill through. Right. They could move to the construction uh, if you had a problem. Um, and uh, at that point, in, from 89 on, uh, load line one, two, and three were one bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would go up there and check the transformers, mm -hmm. uh, which were PC contaminated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, it, it's... Uh, it's amazing the, the perimeter fencing. Uh, once a month, I had to drive the entire perimeter mm -hmm. and check for um, motion detectors and sound detectors mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure that everything worked. Uh, yep. All of the underground facilities that were put in in 1939 were deteriorating, uh, yeah. you know, month by month. Right. And they had to replace them. Um, and we, we ended up putting in uh, two-way radio equipment that would uh, be handled by all of the, the supervisors, managers, um, and, and that so we, we didn't have to use uh, hardwired emergency telephones hmm. and, and so on. But that was, it was quite a place to work. Yes, sir. You might be interested to know that we we drive the perimeter twice a day now, and they and they vary their times, of course, for OPSEC, but at least two times in twenty four hour period, the whole the entirety of the perimeter gets driven, and also load line one, two, and three, all the buildings have been removed, and those load lines now are used for track and tank maneuver space for defensive and offensive maneuver. So every building in those load lines have been removed. Do you still have uh, the. Uh... Let's see, there was uh, three, there were three substations, uh, substation one, substation two, and depot substation. Uh, we had two different feeds. Uh, one was from Newton Falls and the other was from Wyndham. If, okay. one, if one went down, mm -hmm. we could switch over to the other so that there was never a period of time where it was out for more than an hour. Okay, uh, yes, sir. And, uh, I do know that they've, I don't know what the substations are, but they've rerouted a lot of the electrical lines to just follow South Service Road. They don't go into the load lines anymore. So all the electrical lines just go South Service Road all the way to the east side and back. So Red Talk still there? I don't know that, sir. No, I don't know. The, the uh, red, readiness and efficiency, the Navy, there was a, a Navy mm -hmm. unit that was there, Red Talk. No, sir. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. That we have a, um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, ODA, Operation Demolitions Area, that the Army Corps of Engineers run. And the Army Corps of Engineers checked out all of the um, uh, bunkers themselves, and they sealed them and verified that there's no munitions in them. But Redcon is not a, a term that I've heard, and there's not very much of a Navy presence on the post. took care of all the two-way radios uh, through, throughout the arsenal. Yes, sir. When we went from Motorola to Johnson, Equipment, right, uh, which was from, from 40 watts to 110 watts. Yes, sir. Uh, we put a repeater on the uh, water tower. The water tower. Yes, sir. It's still there. Uh, which covered the entire arsenal. It's still there. We still uh, use it. Yep. I, I pointed that sucker on top of the the water tower. My well, side. thank you. Could we use it all the time? So <laughs> <laughs> the uh, we use Marks radios now, not Motorola Marks. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but those are gets us all over whenever we have units out there. To access. Uh, the, the repeater and uh, using the phone system, uh, you, you can access dial tone and dial a, a supervisor's authorization code. You can dial any number inside or outside the plant uh, yes, from your handheld uh, handy talk. Yes, sir. So, well, so communication is still very, very important to us. So, who else has a question, sir? Yeah, I, I've actually been out for a couple of the uh, Homeland Security. Things Exercise, yeah. and uh, with Rick. Mm -hmm. but about ten years ago, I think we had a guy come here from the arsenal mm -hmm. to give a to give a talk on it. Colonel and, Mead, huh? Colonel, my boss. Name. Okay. I okay. Think, I think he's a private, but his his main job, and what he's involved with, was cleanup. Mm -hmm. and he talked about phosphorus grenades and stuff just pushed into the swamp. Hmm. You know, years and years ago, and I guess you know if they rust through, they explode. Hmm. But uh, anyway, is is that complete? Or is it is it a safe place now? So yes, or so ninety five percent of the posts are remediated. Uh, what I think you're talking about is Ramsdale Quarry, 
And in the at towards the end of the Arsenal days, they had a lot of um, the the uh, firehouse fire department was was using phosphate or something to put fires out. It was like a phosphate sodium mix, and that where that used to be is one of our areas of concern. And Ramsdale Quarry is our is areas of concern. Now phosphorus grenades, not sure, but there is several bad things in that quarry that will stay bad things for the entirety of my lifetime, probably several lifetimes. Um, but and that place is going to remain off limits and area concern. But 95% of the post is is clean, ready to use, and we're training. As a matter of fact, in, in July, we set a new standard of 20,000 boots on the ground. So if a soldier is there for one day, we call that a boot on the ground, right? Um, so over the course of the entire month of July, we had 20,000 boots on the ground, people training. And that was our, our high, high water mark for training. So... Um, they think it's clean enough to let that many soldiers come on post, you know. So still have some areas. definitely have areas of concern. They're yeah. they're well marked and they are well. Uh, yeah, we avoid soldiers. Yes, sir. Having, having been to Grayling and Fort Drum, New York, mm -hmm. and uh, Fort McCoy is counseled in the National Guard. Yeah, uh, I think the the J J Garfield camp would be head and shoulders above those. Yes, sir. We like to think so. We're trying. We're trying our level best, you know? So who else has a question? Hey, who is, uh, what jurisdiction is, covers that for fire and whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question because I've seen there's 300,000 some acres that have been bought by Chinese businesses. And I know that uh, Senator Brown, and Governor DeWine have both introduced legislation to try to limit foreign investment buying Ohio farms. Um, I will tell you that the north part of the post where Wyndham is is a very uh, poor area, and uh, they're not doing well up there. So I think that if you were looking at investment to buy land, you could probably get some pretty cheap land on the north side. Down in Paris Township and Newton Falls and Ravenna and Charlestown, not so much, but on the north side of post, there's probably some available farmland, but I believe that Senator Brown and, and Governor DeWine are both working on initiatives to limit foreign investment in farmlands. So, and all that is from the personal side of me and what I've read. None, none of that is from the mil I don't hear any of that in the military that we're restricting any land sales or there's anything restricted around the arsenal. So, who else has a question? Who's the... Who is the emergency jurisdiction over the arsenal? I'm happy to answer any question. No one asked about the deer hunts. So we usually get a lot of questions about the deer hunts. So we're doing three this year. So man. say again, ma'am. Oh, well, my guys, I'm not a hunter, right? Because I feel like the deer should have an equal chance of shooting me back, right? But um, they bring jerky. I love the beef jerky, the venison jerky. So when they bring that, I don't tell my wife, but that's usually in the headquarters building. <laughs> A bag in the back of the headquarters building, you know, so. No testing. So. Testing one, too. Yep. Any Who other questions? Who all, I'm surprised. Oh, Usually somebody raised their hand and says, when, can I get a tour? Can I, come, can I come out and take a look? I want to see something from the old days, so. Yes, sir, please. Ah, very good question. Yeah. That idea. So there was three places. It was um, Fort Drum, New York, um, in Michigan, not Grayling. What was the name of that post in Michigan? Gosh, can't remember the post in Michigan. And then, um, and then at the time, Camp Ravenna. And it was really because of the bedrock and the limestone that made that really conducive. So there's two air defense sectors. There's WADS, which is Western Air Defense Sector, and EADS, which is Eastern Air Defense Sector. And they convinced Congress that they can cover both. They don't need a northern defense sector because I think it was about $3 billion was the price tag to come build. Um, so in the end, they said they weren't going to select the site. They said if they were going to select the site, it was going to be Drum. And then we were second and Michigan was third. But um, they decided that WADS and each together can cover it. They don't need a northern defense sector. So... Yeah. Well, I, I've talked to my wife several times. I'm surprised that we don't have soldiers in Ukraine right now. I really am. So, but that's federal policy, right? Of who's going over there. I mean, that's the kind of fight that we are trained for and that we're good at. 
Um, in the old days, they probably would have rushed in to fight the Russians. Today, our decision makers, our government officials are, aren't uh, actively supporting that. I really don't see us going to some place like Gaza. I don't, I don't think you're going to see um, United States Army or reserve forces in and around Israel. Um, but we still maintain a large presence in the uh, Middle East. We've got uh, our 16th Engineer Brigade is going to Kuwait <clears throat> for a one-year deployment. Um, so I, I see that. And then, of course, you know, Indochina, Taiwan, what's developing over there. There's always always something getting heated up. So, yes, sir, they sure do. So that that could be a, that could be a fight somewhere in there. So, so we'll see. When you look at what's happening in Ukraine now, Ukraine has been very successful in using very expensive drones. Mm -hmm. It almost like it almost makes the tank a useful weapon. You're right. So that's um, an emerging technology. Um, so there's a lot with air defense right now, and there's a lot of investment in counter UAS. Uh, as a matter of fact, on our post, they're going to be doing some testing where they're doing, uh, they're going to fly drones and they have the radar cards on the side of them, and they're going to shoot lasers at the drones to see how effective it would be. Um, so that's a DOD entity that's going to come on and do some testing. We're just providing the airspace for them. Um, but that's an emerging technology and that's a future fight for sure, for sure. Yes, sir. I mean, counter UAS is a place to be right now, like same as uh, on the computers, right? So anyone else, sir? I, yes, sir. I just went to, uh, I did MOA in April. So yeah, but yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was with it and I'm a member. So Mahoning Valley Military Officers Association of America. Yes, sir. But thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was really good. Very interesting. And hopefully everybody found it as interesting as I did. I, a lot of stuff I didn't know about the Revent Arsenal. So I think that was great. So that's it for tonight.